This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned. But he who believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him, And to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our time in God's word this morning, let's go to the Lord and ask his guidance on our time in his word. Father, we pray today that as we study your word that we might be able to concentrate and focus and that we might be reminded of the faithfulness of your grace, the faithfulness that you have demonstrated in history to your promises, to your covenants, and that we may be reminded of of your magnificent grace to us, that none of us deserve anything from you other than your judgment, but nevertheless, in your in your love and righteousness, you have provided for us a perfect Savior and a perfect salvation. And on the basis of that, we know that, that we can have salvation freely as a gift. And all we need to do is accept it by believing in Christ as our Savior, and by faith alone, we have eternal life. Now, Father, we pray that you might challenge us with your word today, help us and strengthen us as a result of our study. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Today we begin in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. For those who are visitors this morning, we began a new series on Matthew two weeks ago. The first lesson was an overview, what I call a flyover, to give us an overall orientation to to a book, especially a long book of 28 chapters like Matthew, and that way we can sort of get an, an orientation and focus on the message of the book as a whole, for this is a, not a history, it's not a biography, although it has, as I pointed out last time, though it's not historical, it is, although it isn't a history, it is historical, though it isn't a biography, it is biographical, though it's not a theology, it is theological. It teaches us things about who Jesus Christ is and what he came to do. The focus of each gospel is a little different. Each one is written in order to demonstrate a principle or a point about the uh, person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Matthew is written in order to teach that Jesus is indeed the King of the Jews. And so the book begins giving us a an orientation to Jesus as the rightful heir of David, the king of the Jews. As we begin this first section, going through the first uh, four chapters of Matthew, Matthew will focus upon the life of Jesus. Now, this is a little bit of a graphic. It may be a little difficult to see everything here. That's why it has the images. We start off with the genealogy. Then we have the announcement to Joseph, and then we go to the birth of our Lord in in Bethlehem. Then there's the, uh, we'll compare that with the uh, story in Luke, the announcement to Mary. They're traveling to Bethlehem, the birth, the visit of the Magi, uh, the shepherds and the Magi, and then the attack, uh, the slaughter of the uh, uh, infants by uh, by Herod. All of that we'll cover in the next couple of weeks. So this just kind of gives us an overview in terms of the birth. We don't know much about the early early life of Jesus from the, from the time that he was uh, born until his, uh, the beginning of his ministry, with the exception, Luke tells, of his visit to the temple when he was about 12 years old. Other than that, we know, we know nothing. The Bible doesn't tell us because it's not significant for us to know those things. 
The Gospels are written not to tell us everything we want to know about Jesus, but to inform us about the things we need to know so that we have a proper understanding of his uh, role and purpose to come as the one who would save us uh, from our sins. Now, what makes one of the things that it makes Jesus unique is the virgin conception and virgin birth, which is the focal point of Matthew chapter 1. Uh, both the genealogy in the first 17 verses and the uh, way in which the writer pre- uh, presents his birth, the announcement to uh, Joseph by the angel that Mary, to whom he is betrothed, is a virgin, but yet she has uh, become pregnant of the Holy Spirit. The focal point in these 25 verses is on that unique Uh, virgin conception and birth, which means that the Lord Jesus Christ is conceived without uh, a uh, patrilineal, that means a descent through his father, to Adam, because that way he did not, uh, if he had been born of a human father, he would have uh, inherited a sin nature from Adam and the condemnation that goes with that sin nature. Being born of a virgin meant that that was blocked, that was prevented, and so that his, he is born without sin. Now the Bible makes a claim, both in Matthew and Luke, these are the only two Gospels that have birth narratives. The other Gospels, Mark and Luke, begin with Jesus in his adult ministry. The claim of the Scripture is that Jesus was conceived... Uh, by Mary, without sexual intercourse, by the power of God, uh, the God the Holy Spirit. Both Matthew and Luke state that Jesus was born as a legal heir to the throne of David, and that he does not have a direct line to David back through Joseph, that uh, this is due to the virgin virgin birth. So what we see in Matthew one eighteen is that the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, then, before they came together, before they were married, before they had any sexual intimacy, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now Luke tells the story a little differently. The focal point in Matthew, as we'll see, is on Joseph, and what Joseph is thinking, and the revelation by the angels to Joseph Whereas in Luke, the focus is upon Mary, what Mary is thinking, and what happens with regard to her. In Luke 1.26, we're told that in the sixth month, that relates to the sixth month of the pregnancy of her uh, relative Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Notice the emphasis there is on Joseph's relation to the house of David as well. The virgin's name was Mary. And behold, you will conceive in your womb, the angel tells her, and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. This parallels the announcement by the angel in Matthew 1 to Joseph that they should name the child Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. This is from the Hebrew verb yasha, which means to save or to deliver. It, like the Greek counterpart, it can refer to physical deliverance from some sort of trauma or some sort of life-threatening situation. It can refer to healing from a disease, but it has a greater meaning in salvation or deliverance from the penalty of sin. And so it is clear that uh, Jesus is being named this because his purpose is to deliver uh, his people to save them from their sins. He is to be called Yeshua, uh, which is the name, the noun form from uh, the verb Yasha. It is the same word as Joshua. We have Josh, several Joshuas in the Old Testament. It's the same name that you have for, for Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is really a translation or transliteration from, in English from the Greek. The Greek form is Jesus, uh, which is uh, taken from the Hebrew Yeshua. So Yeshua is the same form as Joshua, but because it went through the Greek, we end up with the name uh, name Jesus. 
Luke one thirty two, the angel goes on to say, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Again, an emphasis on his connection, his descent from David the king, uh, the great king with whom God had get made a covenant. And then he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now, the first problem we see is how do we validate these claims? How do we validate these claims that Jesus is of the uh, descent from royalty, uh, from the house of David, and also the claims related to uh, the virgin conception and virgin birth? The solution is through birth records. The uh, Jews kept meticulous genealogical records, uh, especially of the priests, but also of all of the tribes. And this became, we know from uh, the literature of the uh, Second Temple period that it became especially true after their return from Babylon because after the exile to Babylon, once that occurred and everybody was uh, uprooted and taken as captive away from their traditional homes and their traditional cities, then they went to Babylon. Then after the 70 years of Babylon captivity, when you had groups that returned, at different times under uh, Ezra, under Nehemiah, under Zerubbabel. Then as, as they returned, uh, you had to make sure that you, you were maintaining your appropriate records related to uh, land inheritance, related to position in society, related to Levitical uh, priesthood and to the high priest. And, and we know of references from... Uh, Others, for example, Josephus, that there were these uh, meticulous records that were kept. So even though uh, we have a problem in that the genealogies of Matthew and Luke do not agree, we know that both Matthew and Luke had access to records, that they are they demonstrate in many other areas of their writings that they are meticulous in their uh, use of detail, and especially Luke as a historian is meticulous in his use of his uh, research and resources. So we have to approach the text on the basis of two assumptions. Assumption one is it's the infallible and errant word of God, and therefore it is true even though we may see things or recognize things that we don't have enough information about to put together or to resolve an apparent contradiction. We know that uh, from other many other examples uh, in Scripture where it was thought that there was a conflict or contradiction, that later as more information surfaced, that these apparent contradictions, these alleged contradictions were resolved. Never ever has history or archaeology uh, demonstrated any true uh, or lasting uh, contradiction in Scripture. Now, there are things that appear to be contradictory or appear to that we can't quite explain, but that's due to a lack of historical or archaeological evidence, and that's especially true in light of the genealogies because we just don't have access to a tremendous amount of, of information. These uh, records that were kept were kept in what is now the old city of Jerusalem. This is a graphic uh, demonstrating the size of the city at the time of, of Jesus' life. And it's oriented north to south. This was the temple precinct here. Uh, this area right here is part of the original old city of, uh, of, of Jerusalem, the Jebusite city that, that David uh, conquered back around 1000 BC. Uh, during the time of Jesus, this, the city had, of course, been, been built, expanded, was much, much larger. And out, just outside the temple precinct in this area here is, was referred to as the priestly quarters. Some of you have gone with me to Israel. And this is the area near what was the the burnt house. That was uh, part of this area that they uncovered. But this was the priestly quarters, and we go through a long area there uh, inside where the archaeological digs are, and it shows the foundations of these houses and some of the walls and the mosaics 
of the uh, of, of the second temple period of the time time of Christ. Well, they're located uh, near there, and we, they believe that this is pretty close to the location. Uh, there was a place of public record where the official genealogical uh, records were stored and housed, and this is represented here in this uh, picture, which is taken from the model uh, over in the uh, Israel Museum. Uh, those of you who haven't been there, uh, a number of years ago, somebody built a scale model of the first century city of Jerusalem that is uh, quite large uh, to walk around, but everything is built to scale and everything is quite meticulous and it gives you a tremendous feel for what the city was like in the first century. And so this is the depiction of the uh, public archives, uh, the record house for uh, for the Jews there. And so this would have been a place where all of the legal documents were kept. But what happens during the Roman revolt, or the Jewish revolt against Rome, from 66 to 70, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and burned the temple, of course, all of these records were lost. Uh, there were other places where records were kept, but we just don't have access to the records that were available it, to the writers of the gospel in the first century. Matthew's gospel begins in verse 1 by saying, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, many of us, when we sit down to read the Bible and we come across uh, a genealogy, that say, okay, well, I'll just skip that and go to the uh, story where it begins down in verse 18. I understand that. We've all done that at times. But the reality is that, that these genealogies are extremely important and extremely significant because from the very beginning of Genesis, from Adam uh, and his descendants, and that's recorded in Genesis chapter 5, to Noah, then Noah and his descendants, and that's recorded in Genesis chapter 10, and then the descendants of Shem down to Abraham, that's recorded in Genesis chapter 11, and then throughout the rest of the New Testament, there are these lengthy genealogies such that you can go back and document and trace the family lineage from father to son all the way from uh, Adam down to Jesus, and those records were kept. So this shows us that this isn't just some sort of mythology or some invented religious system, but that it's grounded in history, and that the birth of Jesus is connected through these, these technical genealogies going back to Adam demonstrating the fulfillment of God's promise in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman, which is a, an allusion to the coming Messiah, would defeat the seed of the serpent. But as we begin in looking at this first verse, there's a bit of a translation problem. Because if you read this, it looks like this is a book about genealogy. The book of genealogy is if this is a title for the first part of chapter 1, and that's all that it is describing. It looks something like this in the Greek, I've given you the transliteration in the bottom line, Biblos Genesios Yesu Christu. Now what's interesting about this is that that does not necessarily mean the book of the genealogy. If we go to the early part of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it says this is the book of and notice it's the same uh, same words, Biblos, Genesios, and then instead of Jesus, it's Aranos for heaven and earth. Translated in Genesis, this is the account of the heavens and the earth. This is in the Hebrew, the word toledot, which is used a number of times in Genesis at the end of each major section, says this is the account, this is a, in the old King James, I think it said this is the generation of the, uh, of the heavens and the earth, this is the generation of Adam, this is the generation of Noah, this is the generation of, Ab of Abraham. And, and probably the best translation is what you find in, for example, New American Standard. Uh, I think New King James says this is the record of the heavens and the earth. Uh, New American Standard, uh, ESV, others translated, this is the account of the heavens and the earth, or this is the history of the heavens and the earth. 
And so by comparing Matthew 1.1 and the Greek language there to Genesis 2.4, what we see is Matthew is connecting what he is saying to the background in Genesis. Just as John, in the beginning of his gospel, says, in the beginning was the word. He uses the same Greek phrase there, in the beginning, that the Septuagint uses. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament uses in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So they are consciously connecting what they are writing to Genesis chapter 1 to demonstrate the, the, the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. And so when we then translate Matthew 1.1 instead of saying this is, or instead of saying this is the book of the genealogy, if we understand it to be this is the account or this is the history of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So this is a title for the gospel. He is going to give us an account of, of Jesus the Messiah who is the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now what's interesting here is this emphasis upon David first. Notice the son of David. He doesn't talk in order and say this is the son of Abraham, then the son of David, which is the chronological order, but he gives David priority. Now the phrase son of David becomes a title, a messianic title, that is used in the Old Testament in reference to the promise uh, God gave to David in the Davidic covenant. And so he, the writer of, of this gospel, who's writing to the Jews, is emphasizing from the very first line the Davidic descent of Jesus. And notice he says this the son of David... And that emphasizes his relationship qualification to be a uh, in the royal line of David. Now, this takes us back to the Davidic covenant, which was given about 1000 B.C., where God promised an eternal house, an eternal kingdom, and an eternal throne to, to David. This To have an eternal house, eternal kingdom, and eternal throne, the person who sits on the throne and rules the kingdom has to be eternal. But this is also a physical descendant of David. And thus in that embedded within that covenant in 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 16, is the implication that the one who fulfills the covenant is both human as a descendant of David, but is also divine because he is eternal. But the Davidic covenant itself is but a fulfillment of the earlier Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant was given approximately a thousand years before the Davidic covenant, and this is the covenant that sets apart Abraham and his descendants, the Jews, from the rest of the human race. God promised a, uh, a land to Israel, which was expanded on in the land covenant or the real estate covenant of Deuteronomy 30, a seed, which is ultimately fulfilled through the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7, and then a new covenant, which is what Jesus establishes through his death on the cross in Jeremiah uh, chapter 31. And so as we look at uh, Matthew chapter 1, it is, Matthew starts by connecting what he is going to say to the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant first and then the Abrahamic covenant. Now, there have been a number of attacks upon the virgin birth uh, of Jesus, and that is not anything new. It w occurred in the scriptures. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 54 through 57, when Jesus taught people in the synagogue uh, in his hometown of uh, Capernaum, it, we read in Matthew 13 that the people were amazed and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? They said, isn't his mother's name Mary, and aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't, they, aren't all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. So they questioned. They said, look, we know him. We know his family. We know his parents. How can he be doing all this? So they're beginning to reject his uh, claims to be the Messiah. People in Nazareth said in Luke 4.22, isn't this Joseph's son? And so the Bible tells us that there were these attacks upon the 
parentage of Jesus even during his own lifetime. In fact, during uh, <clears throat> after the crucifixion, the uh, Sanhedrin would put out several uh, rumor control uh, uh, propaganda messages, one of which was that, that, that Jesus' uh, uh, body, body was uh, stolen from the grave, uh, really wasn't resurrected, that countered all of the evidence, but they, uh, they were trying to control the information to prevent people from knowing the truth. And another thing they did was they put out the claim that Jesus really was illegitimate, that his mother Mary had had an adulterous affair with a Roman soldier named Panthera. And this is cited in some uh, later sources, even in Jewish sources in, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the Talmud, uh, to try to discount, discount the claims of the virgin birth. So how then do we do we refute this? We go to the records, we go to the genealogies, and this is what both Matthew and Luke have done. However, there are some problems with that. There are these disagreements, and there have been a number of attempts down through the centuries, going back to the early part of the uh, third century, as early as 225, to try to uh, explain the differences between these two accounts. Now, the, as I pointed out earlier, the problem we have is that we don't have all of the records today. We don't have all of the information, so uh, to a certain degree, every every position has a certain amount of historical conjecture, but that doesn't mean we can't come to understand uh, the truth. As we see here in this particular chart uh, that I pulled up, uh, we, there's a difference between Matthew and Luke. In the top part, um, the section from Abraham to David on the left side in Matthew is identical to the, uh, to the parallel in, in, um, in Luke. But things began to change under the uh, where it makes a distinction after David. After David the king, the Matthew line is traced through Solomon, and the line in Luke, which according to this chart, takes the view that Ma- Matthew presents the um, Matthew presents the descent on Joseph's side, and Luke presents the descent on Mary's side. Uh, you see that one line goes through Solomon, and the other line, the one in Luke, goes through another of David's son, sons, which is Nathan. This comparison shows that uh, the only point where they show a commonality is in the post-exilic period, where both Sheltiel and uh, Zerubbabel, are mentioned, and uh, that's where the lines come together. But nevertheless, you have, and that's because of intermarriage, the line on in the Luke side goes up, still goes up to Nathan. The line on the uh, Matthew line goes up through Zerubbabel uh, to Solomon. Now, what we know is that both genealogies go to Joseph. This is one of the uh, reasons that there is a bit of a uh, contradiction. How do we explain that? And one explanation is that one is a physical line. The other presents the legal line, physical line versus the legal line. The second option it, and but both go to both go to Jesus. That's the first option. The second option is that the Matthew genealogy is to Joseph, and the Luke genealogy is to Mary. And I want to talk about those uh, just a little bit. But first, let's point out some of the differences between the two genealogies. Uh, to do this, what you might want to do is hold your place in Matthew one and turn over to Luke. Go past Mark to the Gospel of Luke. And we go to Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 23. Luke 3, 23. Now, one of the things that's, that you immediately notice is that Matthew seems to put the genealogy in what we might think is the appropriate location, which is at the beginning. But in Luke, Luke doesn't include the genealogy until he's already had the birth of Jesus and he's had his... Uh, 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 a baptism by John the Baptist, and that he is 
um, then presented in terms of his his genealogy. So that shows that he's using it for a slightly different reason and a slightly different purpose. Now, if you look at Luke 3.23, we read, Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. Now, that's just an approximation. Luke is very clear when he wants to be, but here he's saying it was around 30 years of age. Most people believe, based on chronology, that he was closer to 34 or 35 years of age precisely, but he is making this general statement about the age of 30 because this was the you had to be at least this it had to be at least 30 years of age before you could serve as a in, in any kind of ministry function under the Mosaic Law. So he's simply making the point that Jesus has reached that age, he's beyond that age, and in terms of his phys- physical age, he's qualified uh, to enter into his ministry. Uh, he is then called the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi. Now, that is different than what we have in Matthew. In Matthew, we have to look at Matthew 1.15, and there we see Iliad beget Eliezer, Eliezer beget Methan. See, there's not a Methan over there in, in, in Luke. There's a Methat, but not a Methan. Many people think, well, maybe those are the same people, and they attempt to resolve the conflict by uh, identifying them as the same. Um, Joseph is said to be the son of Heli in Luke 3.23, and in Matthew 1.16, he is the son of Jacob. So how are we to understand that? That's, that's one of the points of, uh, of contradiction. Well, let's just point out, as I've started to, the dif- differences between the two genealogies. First of all, Matthew's line is descending. In other words, he starts with David and goes from David to Solomon, then Solomon to uh, Rehoboam, and then and, and actually he skips Rehoboam, but he goes through. He goes from yeah, he goes from Rehoboam to Abijah, Abijah to Asa, leaves out a number of uh, the kings, but it's in descending order. Whereas Luke is ascending order. He starts with Jesus and says Jesus is the son of Joseph, Joseph is the son of Heli, and then he then he takes it back all the way to Adam. And then Adam, being created by God, is called uh, the Son of God. So Matthew's list is descending, father to son. Luke's list is ascending, going from son, son to father. Second difference is that uh, the end point for Matthew is Abraham. He doesn't go back beyond Abraham because his point is simply to uh, emphasize the uh, right of Jesus to reign on the throne, that he is the Jewish Messiah. He's writing to a Jewish audience, and so he doesn't need to go beyond Abraham. Luke is writing to a Gentile audience with a different focal point, and so he wants to uh, relate Jesus to the entire uh, human race. Third difference, Matthew stops occasionally to explain uh, the significance of an entry. He has little editorial additions uh, between some of the names. Luke never does that. Uh, Matthew structures his according to three groups of 14. There's a reason for that in that in uh, one form of Jewish hermeneutics at the time, uh, they used uh, they would assign number values to each letter. And so the numeric value of the name David uh, was 14. And by organizing the genealogy without putting everybody in there in three groups of 14, by his organization, Matthew is again emphasizing the Davidic relationship of Jesus. And so that's the reason. Now, some people say, well, look, this obviously... Uh, uh, there are gaps here, so that means there are gaps in other genealogies. There's two types of genealogies. There's one that's just tracing lineage where there are gaps. And there are other genealogies, like the ones in Genesis 5 and Genesis um, Genesis uh, 11, that insert numbers, that so-and-so was so many years old when he gave birth, and he lived another number of years. And once you put numbers in there, you, 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 you restrict any 
uh, any 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 uh, uh, absences or any any uh, skipping over of generations. So and those genealogies are closed genealogies, but this is an open genealogy. It's simply giving enough information to be able to trace uh, the lineage of, of Matthew. Another difference, fifth difference, is that Matthew lists five women, including Mary. These include uh, Ruth, and Rahab, Tamar, and interestingly, uh, Bathsheba. Bathsheba is not named, though. She is simply called the wife of Uriah. We'll talk about her a little later on. Sixth difference is that Matthew's list is much shorter. He has 41 names. Luke's is longer. He has 57 names. Seventh difference is that most of the names in each list are absent from the other. So either uh, you end up with the view of many liberal theologians who say, well, they're both making it up and they're just trying to put these uh, names in there for some sort of theological agenda, but it's not really grounded in uh, actual fact. Uh, you, if you go that way, of course, you just throw out the Bible. It doesn't matter because it's not uh, teaching anything that's, uh, that's accurate. And the other is that, that these are different genealogies leading in a, a way to different, different people. Now, in resolving the conflict, the oldest known view is from an early church father uh, from Africa known as Julius Africanus. And roughly his dates are about 225 A.D. He is, uh, he is cited by Eusebius in his ecclesiastical history. And, the way, and this is the oldest attempt to resolve the difference. And he said that Matthew provided the natural or physical line of descent from David to Joseph, while Luke provides the royal line uh, of descent from Nathan down to uh, down to Mary, uh, I mean, excuse me, down to Joseph, and in that view, both lines go literally and truly to Joseph. Now, I don't think that's the best solution, but there and there are variants. There's about five or six different variants. I've been spending weeks trying to work my way through all these little different things because. Uh, there are a lot of different little variants to these, and I'm not going to load you with all of those particular details. But what happens when you uh, look at this is there are a number of good conservative scholars and Jewish background Christians, Messianic Jews, who take this view. The foremost is uh, Alfred Adersheim. Some of you may be familiar with his work. It's about four inches thick, called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. Adersheim was trained. Uh, he, he, um, he grew up in Eastern Europe. He was trained as a student of the Talmud and as a student of the Torah. And when he was uh, 17 years old, uh, a missionary led him to a messianic understanding of who Jesus was, and he became a Christian. He later uh, immigrated to Scotland, was ordained, uh, went through seminary training in Scotland, and was ordained in the Church of Scotland. And he has written a number of books, very technical books, wonderful books, very helpful books, on the uh, background, Jewish backgrounds to the New Testament. And he takes this particular view, uh, so this is not one to be taken lightly. And this was also taken by a number of other noted conservative uh, scholars like J. Gresham Machen uh, during the 20th century. I think there are some problems with this particular, uh, particular view. They resolve the differences by appealing to the principle of leveret marriage and that because of uh, 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 Joseph's grandfather was childless, that his brother uh, then marries and has a child in his name. This is why you then have the difference between Heli and Jacob as the father of Joseph. That is one solution, and I don't think that is the, uh, that is the best solution. The other solution is the one that you've probably heard most and the one that uh, many others take. Arnold Fruchtenbaum takes this particular view, as do, as do uh, several others. Uh, this is the view Ryrie takes. It's the view 
Uh, I think John MacArthur takes a number of other scholars uh, take this particular view, but it's not. This isn't an issue necessarily of conservative versus liberal, because there are very solid scholars and very solid uh, historians that differ over this. And the reason is, is we're lacking certain specific historical documentation to be absolutely 100% certain on either view. But I do take the second view that the Matthew genealogy is Joseph uh, related to the (coughs) physical royal descent line down through through Joseph, but the genealogy in Luke is to Mary, and I'll explain that as we go along. The reason that (coughs) we make an issue out of this is because that one of those mentioned in the descent of, of Joseph is Jeconiah in verse 12. 11 and 12, we're told that Josiah begot Jeconiah, who was one of the evil last few evil kings in the southern kingdom. Josiah begat Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begat Shaltiel, and Shaltiel begot Zerubbabel. Now, the problem here is a passage from Jeremiah known as the Keniah Curse. Uh, Jeconiah, his name is shortened uh, sometimes to Coniah. And in Jeremiah 22.30 we read, that says the Lord, Write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. This means that no one who is a physical descendant uh, through, of Solomon through Jeconiah would be qualified to be the Messiah. And so as we look at what is going on here in, in, in Matthew chapter 1, and the overall structure of Matthew chapter 1 is that uh, the focus is on Joseph. Joseph is the emphasis for Matthew. Joseph is the one the angel appears to. Joseph is the one whose thoughts that are described. Uh, Joseph is the one who is responsible for naming naming the son. The focal point is on Joseph. And so what Matthew is showing, as well as the virgin conception and birth. So the point that, one of the points that Matthew is making is that Joseph could not be the physical father of Jesus at all. Uh, He's not talking about it legally or any other way, but that this cannot be the lineage because of Jeconiah. And so this is his point. Joseph is not the the father of Jesus, but the focal point there is on, on, um, on Joseph. Then if we look at Matthew, if we turn over and look at Matthew, I mean, excuse me, look at Luke 3, uh, what we see is a slightly different kind of construction at the beginning of verse uh, verse 23. Jesus began his uh, ministry at about 30 years of age, being as was supposed. See, he's emphasizing right at the front that Joseph is not the actual father uh, of Jesus, that Joseph was the son of Heli. Now, what's interesting is every other use of the, these names in the genealogy of Luke begins with a definite article in the Greek. Now, we don't put a definite article before our names. We don't talk about the Tom, the Bill, the Sally. We, we don't do that. But in uh, that was appropriate uh, Greek grammar. But the one name in this list that lacks the definite article is that of Joseph, which indicates that he is not talking about Joseph. He is substituting Joseph's name for his wife's name, Miriam. Luke omits any mention of a woman in the genealogy, whereas four women, as I pointed out earlier, actually five, including Mary, are mentioned in Matthew chapter 1. In Luke, the omission of any woman was standard in Jewish genealogies. The descent is traced through the male. And so since uh, Mary alone was the uh, mother of Jesus, Joseph's name is substituted. Actually, Heli is considered to be uh, Mary's father. And in some uh, Talmud sources where they are attacking Christianity, they refer to Miriam, which is the uh, Hebrew, from Aramaic rather, for, for Mary, that Miriam is the daughter of Heli. 
And so this helps resolve this, this, this difference. So one line is to Joseph showing he cannot be the physical father of Jesus because of the Kaniah curse. And the other line goes through Mary uh, showing that, and once again reinforcing the, the virgin birth. Now the last thing I want to point out in looking at the genealogy, so we go back to Matthew chapter, chapter 1, is the reference to the women, the reference to the women in in the gospel of Matthew, there are four women mentioned. There are four women mentioned, and we see them listed in verse uh, 3 and verse 5 and then verse 6. And there's something interesting about this. I pointed out uh, when we talked, uh, when I gave the overview, I mentioned that um, there were four women, and there are several things that were in common. One I mentioned was that they were Gentile. Somebody asked me about that afterward, which, because Bathsheba, there's a big question mark on Bath, Bathsheba, and I'm still trying to get information about this, but in every Messianic Jewish source that I consulted, they refer to Bathsheba as a Gentile. In other scholarly sources, they talk about the fact, see, Bathsheba is not named. She's simply mentioned as the wife of Uriah. And so a number of other scholarly sources say this is really a statement by Matthew that Bathsheba is treated as a Gentile because she married a Gentile. And then you have uh, some others who recognize that, for example, on the basis of passages like 2 Samuel 11.3, that Bathsheba is the daughter of Eliam uh, who, and uh, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, and that Eliam, according to 2 Samuel 23.34, was the son of Ahithophel the Gilonite. Gilo was a town down south near Hebron. So that's all we know about her her lineage, but it's interesting, and I've got some questions out to uh, some of the Messianic Jewish scholars that I know who take this view, is what's their basis for saying this? Because I found that somewhat interesting that every Messianic um, study that I consulted, written by Messianic Jewish scholars, takes Bathsheba, treats her as a Gentile. And I think that the best that we can say is because of her marriage, to a Gentile, that she is treated uh, with without a lot of respect here by by Matthew, as her name's not given, and she's simply alluded to as the wife of Uriah. Of course, also comes across there is a reference to her sin. Now, as we look at these women that are mentioned, we have Tamar mentioned in verse three, who uh, was married to a son of of, uh, of uh, Judas. And because her, uh, he died before she gave birth, then Judah uh, promised that his, the youngest son would go to her as part of a leveret marriage, and then he failed on his promise that she then disguised herself as a prostitute, stood out on the roadway, and waited for him to come by, and then enticed him to uh, have sexual relations with her, and as a result, uh, she became pregnant. And so there's the taint of prostitution with her, and then we have the mention of Rahab, Rahab in verse 5, known as Rahab the harlot or Rahab the prostitute from uh, uh, the book of Joshua. And she, of course, is tainted by immorality. Ruth was not, but Ruth was a Moabitess. And remember, the Moabites were descendants of incest between Lot and his daughter. And so as a result of that, there is this taint of immorality with uh, Ruth by virtue of her being a Moabitess. And then, of course, there's Bathsheba, who was guilty of adultery with David. The point of all of this is God's grace. God's grace brings Jesus into the human race. And as a result, in his human lineage, uh, there are those who are not considered to be moral or righteous. They are tainted by uh, acts of immorality and sin. And yet what we see is God's grace is so powerful because of his omnipotence that he is able to provide a solution that overrides all of human sin, all of human problems, so that he ultimately is able to solve the sin problem 
through the perfect solution of sending his son, the eternal second person of the Trinity, to enter into human history and to provide a salvation not just for Jews, but also for Gentiles. And so we have embedded from the very beginning of Matthew this emphasis on the grace of God, the grace provision of salvation through Jesus, whose name means Savior, and who would provide salvation for the entire human race. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect upon this portion of Scripture, to be reminded that there are numerous details embedded within both of these genealogies that are uh, for that that need further study and in depth study but overall what we learn is that you are faithful to your covenants your god who is faithful to your promise to abraham and to david in providing a savior and you are a god of grace who can overcome the problem of sin and can provide a perfect solution as you did through the virgin conception and virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that if there's anyone here this morning that's unsure of their salvation or uncertain of their eternal destiny, that they would take this opportunity to make that both sure and certain. Jesus Christ came to pay the penalty for sin, for all sin, for all mankind, for your sins and my sins, that we might have eternal life, not based on who we are or what we do, but on who God is and what Christ did on the cross. That's the issue in salvation, belief on the Lord Jesus Christ. There, Scripture makes it clear there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. This is your opportunity where you sit to make sure that you are saved, you have eternal salvation. The instant you believe in Christ as Savior, you are saved, Scripture says. You are declared justified by faith, and you're regenerate and a new creature in Christ. Now, Father, we pray for the rest of us as we go through this study that we are reminded of the claims that Jesus is the eternal God and therefore his mandates uh, to us are of extreme ser- of an extremely serious nature and that we are to respond to them in obedience, seeking to follow him and to be disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ through every issue in life. We pray this in his name. Amen. Let's stand for our closing hymn, number 106, Praise Him, Praise Him, and I'm going to ask uh, Morgan Franklin to come up and dismiss us in closing prayer. Please stand. Praise Him.
Father, we thank you for the opportunity to praise you today in song and in study in the in the examination of the beginning of the examination of the life of Christ. We thank you for all that you provide for us. Again, we pray for comfort for those who are ill and could not be with us today. We ask for your mercies as we travel and that we may come together again to continue to worship and praise you. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.